In lecture two, we're going to look at the different types of sampling methods. So returning to our indicative scientific method steps, previously we looked at the different study types available to you as a researcher. We're now going to look at how you actually collect that data that will be used in your study. And that data will ultimately be used in your analysis and hypothesis testing. So firstly, we look at the different types of sampling methods. And then we'll consider some specific methods for actually getting the data. Sampling methods are a way of selecting samples or subsets from a population. And of course, we sample because we're never going to be able to get information for the entire population of interest, or in general, we cannot do that. So there's two types of sampling methods, non-probability sampling, first of all, and then probability sampling. So non-probability sampling is a method where some individuals in a population do not have an equal chance of being selected for the sample. In the above schematic, we can see that we're zooming in on three or four different individuals. The rest of the population does not get a look in in terms of getting into the sample. So it's non-probability sampling. On the other hand, probability sampling is where all individuals have an equal chance of being selected for the sample. Let's consider some different types of non-probability sampling methods. The first non-probability sampling method is convenience sampling. And that's where you take a sample that is convenient for you. If you consider here, you as the researcher are this person and you want to take a sample from your population of interest. In this case, you just take the three people that are nearest to you. So these three people get into your sample. It's convenient for you. The advantage of this method is that it's easy for you to actually select your sample because you're picking people or individuals close at hand. But the disadvantage then is we have to question how good is that sample at representing your population. Another example is say you're interested in some uh, variable of interest in relation to third level students. So what you could do is just stand at the entrance to the campus at 9 a.m., record information for the first 10 students. It would be convenient for you, but by doing that method, you are neglecting people that have classes later in the day. Okay, so certain individuals will not get into your sample. Another example of a non-probability sampling method is judgment sampling, and that's where you, as the researcher, you choose the people that enter your sample and it's based on your knowledge. So the quality of the sample here is really gonna depend on you as a researcher and how you choose to put people into your sample. The final example of a non-probability sampling method is quota sampling. So quotas are groups with a specific type are chosen from a population on a non-random basis. So this means that all members of the population, again, will not have an equal chance of being selected. For example, in the image here, we're choosing a quota such that we are selecting males above 50, but that eliminates the other people in the population because again, this quota is selected on a non-random basis. Some other examples of quotas are given below where a person might need to find 20 adult men, 20 adult women, and teenage girls and teenage boys. So that was three examples of non-probability sampling methods. But these are open to mistakes because not all individuals in your population have an equal chance of being included in your sample. So this means they are open to mistakes because they mightn't be representative of your population. Again, here's an example of convenience sampling. The researcher is picking the clo people closest to them and they enter the sample. So the rest of the people do not have a chance of getting into the population. So mistakes can be made here. And we have a term in statistics for this and that's called bias. So if there's a tendency for a certain group to be excluded from our sample, that is bias. And the way we can eliminate bias is by using random sampling. So random sampling is used with probability sampling methods. Let's look at some examples. 
Firstly, we have a very popular common technique called simple random sampling. So let's say you have a population and you have a list for that population. Each person or individual in that population is assigned a number. And then you can randomly select that number by using, say, a random number generator to pick out the individuals for your population. So this will guarantee that your sample is made up randomly from individuals from your population. Everyone has the same chance of getting into your, into your sample. The second probability sampling method is systematic sampling. So let's say again, you've got a list of individuals in your population. They can be numbered or they don't have to be numbered necessarily. And we select a random starting point in that list. Okay, so for example, let's say in the example below, we have a random number generator. It selects the second person in the list. We also select another, we have another number that's selected randomly, say K, which, which means that we're going to select every K person on from that second individual. So in the case below, K will be three. So starting at person two, we're going to pick out every third person. So two, five, eight, and 11. So this again guarantees that you're going to have a sample that's picked based on a probability. For example, you could use this technique to pick out a list of people from registered voters once you start at a randomly selected point and then uh, num every k person after enters into your sample. Next, we have stratified random sampling. This is where you have a population with certain identifiable strata or subpopulations, and you draw a random sample from each stratum. So consider a population that can be broken up into age groups. So they are your strata in this case, okay? Could be say under 20, between 20 and 40, and above 60. They're your different strata. And then from each strata, you randomly select individuals using say the techniques that we had on the previous two slides. The final probability sampling method is cluster sampling, which is similar enough to stratified sampling. This is where your population is divided into clusters and then the clusters are randomly selected. Now it's different from stratified sampling where samples from the strata are picked out. In this case, you take the entire cluster. So say this population of customers below, we have 10 clusters, and then the individuals that go into the sample are coming from all of cluster one, cluster two, cluster three, and cluster four here. Another example is say you have a list of schools in say a county. Your schools are your clusters, and then you randomly select a subset of clusters representing schools to form your sample. Now that we've looked at the various sampling methods, let's look at how you acquire the data. There are many ways to do this, but we'll just consider a few of them here. Firstly, we have a method which you should all be familiar with, and that is a questionnaire, which is just a list of questions which gathers data from respondents. Some advantages of questionnaires are that they are cost effective. It shouldn't take too many resources to run an effective questionnaire. They're typically easily easy to analyze. You take your data, put it on the computer, and then you analyze it. And questionnaires can also be set up that they're anonymous, which hopefully means that respondents will answer questions honestly. Of course, there is the issue that respondents may answer superficially. I'm sure we're all guilty of this. We get a questionnaire and we'll answer it very quickly just to get it out of the way. Also, we have the problem that we could have a potential low response rate. This is something people who design questionnaires need to think about. How can they get the questionnaire to people and make sure that they answer it honestly? And finally, and this is a big issue, people really, researchers really need to think about the questions that they set in their questionnaire such that they don't have any open-ended questions which can be difficult to process and analyze. Questionnaires can yield both qualitative and quantitative data, depending on the type of question that's in the questionnaire. And as I've mentioned, with some of the disadvantages, 
it really is important that you take time when you're designing your questionnaire, making sure that you have questions that people will answer honestly and accurately. The second method to acquire data is, say, an experiment. And this is just a control study designed to investigate the effects of one or more independent variables on a dependent variable. So just to picture that, consider the independent variable as x in your experiment. It's also referred to as the explanatory variable. It explains changes in the dependent variable or the response variable. So the response variable responds to changes in x. And we can denote that as y. And in your, your experiment, the idea is that you can control x, you can vary it, and then see how y responds to those changes. So you could get a graph, say, like this, with x versus y. Maybe that's a linear relationship or a straight line relationship between x and y. And as, as an example, let's say you have a particular breed of plant and you've many examples of it, and you're interested in measuring, say, the plant's growth in response to changes in light intensity. So x would be light intensity, that's the variable that you control, and y, y would be the growth of the plant, that's your response variable. Now, some of the advantages of experiments, first of all, you have precise control over x, or you should have. You can make changes in it, like for the example I just mentioned, you can control the light intensity. Another advantage is that you can repeat the experiments. Some disadvantages, well, typically, if you're the one doing the experiment, you might have to deal with small sample sizes. Another big issue is that you have to be careful in the experiment that there are, you, you fully understand the system and that you are aware of any other variables that might be lurking in the background. Maybe there are other factors besides, say, light intensity that affect growth. So you have to be aware of that. And finally, as the experimenter or researcher, you have to be careful because you're controlling this experiment or situation. You could be doing it so precisely that it could lead to limited behavior. So you, you might set a narrow boundary on X or a narrow domain. You need to consider what happens outside that domain as well. You don't want to limit the behavior in your system. And finally, experiments, they typically do yield quantitative or numerical data. And the final method we'll look at to acquire data is that of a focus group. And a focus group is a qualitative research method where you have a moderated discussion among a small group of participants to gain information from them on a topic. Some advantages to you as the researcher is that you get to directly interact with the participants in the focus group. You can pose follow-up questions, so you may have a question that you need to ask them. Based on the answer to that question, you can answer or ask further questions. And some of these questions can probe more deeply, okay? You can have a full discussion on these topics. Some disadvantages are that you will typically have to have a small sample size because you don't want your focus group to be too big. Now, because the focus group has people, say, in one room, people may feel pressure to give similar answers based on what they hear their peers saying. And also, finally, these group, dis group discussions can be difficult to steer. So you may lose time in discussing irrelevant topics that are not of interest as part of your research question. Finally, these focus groups typically yield qualita qualitative data, but you can also get quantitative information also. So we'll conclude there, and in the next section, we're going to look at how the data that you've gotten from these various methods is categorized.